It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Sharona Dion, DDS, DMSC. She comes from a family chock full of dentists. As a child growing up in Tehran, she often went to her father's practice after school and saw that his patients were like family. It was her father's A-list of clients that helped him escape persecution in Iran and move his family to safety in the United States. She became the first person in her family to attend Harvard, where she obtained her specialty certificates in perio oral medicine and also became a doctor of medical sciences, conducting NIH-funded research in the field of cancer biology. As a lifelong student, she has obtained advanced training from Carl Misch, Peter Dawson, John Coyce, and Pat Allen. Her curiosity about the whys of periodontal disease and tooth failures led her on a wild journey into sleep, airway, and myofunctional disorders. She loves to teach, and she is working on her first book called Keep Your Natural Teeth. My God, what? It's just an honor. Honor to have you on the show. I can't believe I can get, um, uh, I don't know if I should call you um, Dr. Diane or just Lady Di. Which one <laughs> would you prefer? Lady Diane, Lady Di, Diane. What do you, what do you want me to call you? Um, I, 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 I like, I call this show Dentistry Uncensored because I like to talk not about what everybody agrees on. I want to talk about what everybody um, does, you know, disagrees and argues on dental town all day long and you have so many hot buttons in everything that you do like 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 even when it comes to just something as simple as perio um there are so many periodontists say it's a correlation it's not a cause effect when i make coffee in the morning the sun comes up they're not related um and 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 people po- post studies that um oh part of p gingivalis was found in an alzheimer's brain cell and all this stuff and a lot of people just keep saying correlation or, or correlation 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 not causation um have you crossed the tipping point where it's no longer curious and correlation, but you're starting to believe deep in your heart, in your Harvard brain, that there might be some causation between perio and other diseases, or is it still too early to say things like that? I think it's still a little bit too early, but what I will say is, what if all of these symptoms that we're seeing, Alzheimer's, periodontal disease, et cetera, what if they have a common root that is even deeper than, you know, perio causing Alzheimer's, et cetera? What if those are both um, symptoms of another underlying disorder, like, for example, vitamin D deficiency, or, um, for example, a sleep disorder? That's, uh, that's great. I remember when um, my four boys were little, I'd say, you know, you guys are arguing up in the leaves. Let's let's drop it down. Let's try to get down to a branch. And if we're lucky, we can find the trunk. Or let's get to the root of this argument because that, that that's brilliant. Maybe looking at perio to Alzheimer's isn't the issue. We need to get deeper underneath down to the branches, trunk, and the roots of the problem. And that's what you're saying, that, that they probably have a common ancestor. Like, I'm not related from a chimpanzee, but we definitely share a mom about six million years ago? Is that kind of what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. So for example, today in my practice, uh, the first thing that I do when I have a patient with periodontal disease is look at their vitamin D levels um, to see if they still have their normal microbiome and if they are mouth breathers versus nose breathers. So vitamin D runs our immune system. So a vitamin D deficiency will affect periodontal disease and vitamin D runs sleep. So a vitamin D deficiency will also affect uh, brain disorders like Alzheimer's. Wow. Um, I can tell I'm uh, a hick from Kansas interviewing a Harvard doctor. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, pick up my game here. So the first thing you said you look for is vitamin D and if they're a mouth breather or a nose breather. Yes. So uh, vitamin D um, is so crucial for oral health. It has a very important role in our immune system. And we discovered vitamin D through bone metabolism and rickets. And so of course, what supports our teeth? Bone. And now we know that vitamin D 
is also running uh, the mineralization process of teeth and the pulp is covered with vitamin D. So vitamin D plays a, a significant role in really anything that we do in dentistry. And even recently, they've done many studies um, of vitamin D deficient patients who get dental implants and they have up to 300% higher failure rates than non-deficient patients. So if you are an implant dentist and you are not paying attention to vitamin D, you are playing Russian roulette. Well, you know, I always heard that, you know, vitamin D was because you uh, didn't get enough sun. So that's why I had four sons and didn't have a daughter um, just for vitamin D. <laughs> Uh, uh, um, but you know what uh, truthfully when uh, I'm out here in the desert and you're in Beverly Hills that's pretty much the same desert right yes I I mean it's really I mean from here to Palm Springs uh, almost all the way until you get to Beverly Hills it it must be just an irrigation thing because from Phoenix to Palm Springs I mean you get within about an hour of your place um, it's it's all desert and so the the um, nutritionist the um, the the naturalists, the naturopaths are all saying you should get ten minutes of sunlight a day, and then they go to the dermatologists and, and they say get sun right at noon because they say if you go out in Phoenix um, where it's one hundred and ten in the desert with short sleeve shirts and shorts that ten minutes isn't going to be enough. They say you know you um, you to to get all the vitamin D that you need in ten minutes. My doctor says you'd have to be naked at noon on one side for five minutes, flip over on the other side, five minutes. So then you go to the dermatologist and he says, what are you trying to get killed? You should, you should never, my dermatologist tells me you're Irish dude with a bald head. You never go outside between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So I have two personal doctors telling me exactly the opposite thing. So what, what do you, what do you do there? Okay. So we all metabolize vitamin D differently, and there is no one dose for every person. And so people who are Irish from the Northern latitudes, Irish, Scottish, Canadian, have evolved to um, metabolize vitamin D very efficiently. So during the very short summers, being outside, working outside, building homes, farming, they would get all the vitamin D that they needed for the entire year. So people who have fair skin from the northern latitudes uh, really metabolize D very efficiently. Whereas people who are from the equator need a lot more vitamin D because we are from areas of the world that are sun-drenched. So we need more vitamin D to make what we need. So I always tell my patients, you've got to check your blood levels. That's the only way you know. And the blood levels that are perfect for sleep and for oral health are 60 to 80 nanograms per ml. And so supplement accordingly. And as far as being out in the sun, Uh, It is these days very hard to get all of your vitamin D through just sun exposure because you do have to be out in a bathing suit uh, in the midday sun from 11 to 2. Um, And what I would say is don't burn your skin. So burning is never a good idea. Uh, I do recommend sun exposure. I think children in the summertime should be at the beach, at the pool, but just uh, use sunscreen, especially in the beginning, in sensitive areas, don't burn. And then as the summer goes on, you will build up a tolerance for the sun and be able to stay out longer without burning. I have never heard that. My, my mom swears that her children, her seven children are all 100% Irish. I don't believe it, but I did 23 and Me, and it said we were like 85% Irish. And then the other uh, 29% was bullshit. And then 15% was, um, it was a whole basket of stuff. It didn't equal it all out of 200. But you're saying that people in those northern regions, um, because they didn't get much sun, that they absorb it and metabolize it better, faster, easier, and all that stuff? Yes. And dark-skinned individuals have a much, much higher risk of being vitamin D deficient. 
So is that why us Irish people can drink whiskey so much better? Does the vitamin D metabolize the Jameson? Is that what you said? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a great question. When I lived in Boston, I went to a comedy club and the comedian said, you know, the sun is God's way of telling the Irish, get back in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I can't believe you told me an Irish joke I have not heard and that my mom will laugh so hard on that. Day. Oh, my God. She'll laugh. So what did you You said something very profound. You said that um, say that again about the vitamin D level and implant failure. If the uh, say say that stat you said again, that that was stunning. Mm -hmm. Recent studies show that dental implants placed in vitamin D deficient patients have up to 300% higher failure rates. That's higher than smoking. And we've always known how bad smoking is for dental implants. Um, and I am talking about early failure rates. So in my practice, I check the vitamin D levels before I do, um, before I place the implants, before I do LANAP, and even now soft tissue surgery, and make sure that they are in the 60 to 80 range uh, before undergoing surgery. Man, I'll tell you what, you're just, um, you're just attracted to controversy. I mean, you said another most controversial word, LANAP. I mean, on Dental Town, <laughs> you say LANAP, and is, you might as well just say you're a communist. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just crazy turn. But now, can you, is there a chair side test where I can test vitamin D blood levels next to my dental implant patient in my dental office? Or do I got to send it out? We're getting there. There are um, there are companies working furiously on developing in office testing uh, kits. Right now, they are not as accurate as they need to be. Uh, the The closest thing that we have is you uh, can buy a test online at ultawellness.com or go to uh, grassroots and order a D test to be ordered to your home. At Ulta Wellness, you buy the test for $40. They tell you what the closest lab is and you go and get your blood drawn and you uh, get the results emailed in about three or four days. So you don't have to go to a doctor's office and book through a physician. You can do it all online and then go to the nearest facility. Uh, and you can order a kit to be delivered to your house. You prick your finger, send it out, and then get the results. But we are, I would say by 2021, we will be able to do vitamin D tests chair side, and that will be fantastic. One of the things I've always done is when I lecture, um, you know, I know the dentist isn't coming to the lecture because he's looking for a friend. I'm not there looking for a friend. And I think true friends and family and loved ones tell each other the truth. They don't let you stay in your bubble. So I've always been very hard on my homies because to me, it's a sign of respect. If I really respect you and that back to that vitamin D test, a lot of dentists, you know, when they, you know, when they find out they make 150, 180, $200,000 a year, they think it's all them. And they don't realize it's because the government mob won't let highly trained dentists from Iran come over here and practice dentistry without jumping through all their hoops and all this stuff. So they restrict, like I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation and in 32 years I practice, every five years or so they find some dentist from Mexico, highly qualified, snuck into the Guadalupe city that doesn't have one American dental office there and he's doing dentistry in, in a house and sure enough they arrest him and they, you know, my mama told me not to kidnap people but they kidnap him, take him, put him in a cage deport them and that keeping out all that crap is why dentists and doctors can make that kind of money and I can't and I've been screaming at um, our Arizona government that I'm an American why can't I go into any of these blood deals and order my own test to find out if I'm pregnant or vitamin D deficient or anything no you have to go get your paper are your papers in order you need to go to a doctor and get your papers and pay the and that's just corruption it's naked corruption but it took a pandemic now Arizona you can go into the the big blood thing what's that big blood place out here where everybody does the blood work at uh, but it yeah, Quest. Yeah. So finally, finally an American 
can go in there and say, hey, am I pregnant? Do I have to go through the doctor's toll booth to do that? Um, but um, I got to ask you a selfish question. Um, just for me, it has nothing to do with this. But um, I've noticed on some of these um, perio implant failures, things like that, some, a lot of times they have rheumatism. Do you think rheumatism is related to all this vitamin D, periodontal implant failures? Um, it, it seems it seems like um, it seems like I, I can think of five or six patients that that I have these. I'm 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 not quite sure what's going on, but the one thing they all have in common is they have rheumatism. Mm -hmm. So the correlation, and it is a very good one. I'm so glad you brought this up. When our D levels fall, um, when they fall for a certain period of time, our, we lose our microbiome because vitamin D is a growth factor for our microbiome. And our microbiome makes all the eight vitamin Bs that we need for every cellular function from you know, DNA synthesis, to the Krebs cycle, to mitochondria, every cellular function needs vitamin Bs. So when we lose the microbiome and our D is low, uh, then we start to see illness. And because vitamin B is critical in the adrenal gland for making cortisol, then we start to see all of these illnesses crop up rheumatoid arthritis, you know, IBS and, you know, weight gain and cancer. So the chronic illnesses start to develop from the vitamin B deficiencies. And that is linked to a, D, a primary D deficiency. So, you know, it's kind of, um, I got to know going 87. I, I swear to God, I never heard the word um, sleep mentioned once. And I never heard gut microbiome mentioned once. And then about 10 years ago, it just became all the rage. I mean, it just, um, everybody's onto this. Um, how do you repair your gut microbiome? Mm -hmm. So first you've got to bring your D levels up because you need D to maintain the gut microbiome. And then for a short period of time, you've got to give a high dose um, a B complex. That's how you get the microbiome back. And then if your D levels never fall below 50, you should be able to maintain the microbiome. So if I was worried about my gut microbiome, and I'm I'm serious, I'm as concerned about my gut microbiome as a giraffe would be concerned about his neck, um, because it's a major major part of my body. Um, the first thing you'd recommend I do is go to ultrawellnesscenter.com, order a vitamin D test, and make sure that my levels over fifty milligrams per milliliter, and ideally it should be between sixty and eighty. Yes. Order your uh, D3 and also order a B12. So of D3 the eight Bs, and B12. Mm -hmm, D3 and B12. And of the eight Bs, B12 is the only one that we can really test for because the other seven Bs have body stores. So, but the B12 will give you also an idea about what your general B levels are. And if that's below a thousand, you know, for sure you have lost your microbiome. And then it takes, you know, a few months of uh, supplementing. And Stasha Gomenak, MD, and I know Dr. Joel Gold mentioned her in his podcast with you. Uh, she has a workbook that is so brilliant. And you can download it for $79. And it takes you through all the steps of supplementing your D's and getting your microbiome back. And she is, I would say, the, the top sleep physician in the country. And what's her website for? Doc, yep, drgomenak.com, G O M I N A K. Oh my gosh. Um, so um, again, I'm sorry to say this to you, but when I'm talking to, I, I'm 58. I can tell you, I can give you 10 names of dentists that are around 60 to 65. 
that are still saying the sleep thing, that they know hype when they see it. And they, they say it's a fad. And they say, come on, Howie, we practice through microabrasion and all, all these different fads. Um, what, do you, what do you say to older people who say, uh, older dentists I'm talking about, I mean, they got a doctorate in dental surgery. And they're, they're still thinking the sleep thing is mostly fad. Okay, well, you know, in the 70s, like sleep apnea was not a thing, really. Uh, we didn't really talk about it in dental schools in the 70s and 80s. It was not the epidemic that it is today. But today, the World Health Organization has uh, categorized the U.S. to be a sleep-deprived nation and Every country around the world that's organized enough to have a sleep center is reporting sleep apnea, insomnia, and sleep disorders in record numbers. And so um, this is not something that we really dealt with in the 70s, 80s. It was when in the 70s, the dermatologist told us not to go outside and be afraid of skin cancer. Then we got air conditioning. We started living and working indoors. We lost our relationship to the sun. And it was about five years later that all of these other epidemics started coming up. Sleep apnea, autoimmune disease, you know, fibromyalgia, you know, all uh, autism, attention deficit uh, disorder. So all of these started coming up in um, huge numbers when we began to develop a vitamin D deficiency and uh, sleep deprivation as a result of moving indoors. So do you just like study all the time? I mean, is there anything you ever do when you're not studying? What, what, do, you, what do you do when you're not studying? Are you just sleeping? <laughs> Well, I am very committed to getting my eight or nine hours of sleep a night. <laughs> Practice what I preach. Uh, I have a photography hobby and I love to hike and ride my bicycle. So, um, yeah, that's how I spend my free time. <laughs> I I thought... Um... When, when when they start, and um, by the way, they got microm deal. I, I I've been blown away. My brother lives in Sydney, Australia, and um, you you remember back in the day where the Americans were all saying that ulcers needed to be surgically cut out, and it was a woman doctor down in Australia who said, "I don't know what you're cutting out. This is a this looks like an area where there's a, an infection war going on." And she started treating with antibiotics, and I want I want to remind all my homies in America. You laughed at her for 10 years before you realized she was absolutely right and we were absolutely wrong. And then my brother said, look, they're doing it again. It was another woman doctor 10 years later after the H. pylori thing. And there was a little kid and he'd gone through all the chemo and they said, oh, he's saved from, he's not going to die from cancer, but he, no energy and he was weak. And, and she noticed when he pooped that the tissue around his anus was wiping off. And, and she just turned to the mother and said, I want you to uh, number, take a bowel movement in this bowl and she gave him a fecal matter transplant mm -hmm. and um and he like bounced back to life and you can imagine the jokes now you know here you know the the, the doctors down under doing crap transplants but now the number one transplant in the world is a fecal matter transplant so i'm like asking my mayo clinic doctor in um and here in uh, scottsdale arizona and he said um he told me like three or four years ago yeah we're trying to get it approved and of course they're american so they had to make it a pill you know they they can't you know take medicine um in the other end um but mayo clinic is doing fecal matter transplants and i posted studies on dental town where they find like two six-year-old girls and they're identical twins and one looks like she's headed to her obesity and the other one looks normal and the only variable they could find is one had an ear infection and took a round of antibiotics or whatever and then she's getting fat and then they start taking the fecal matter from the ideal weight one to the other one and restore her gut microbiome and she's fine and this is just bizarre are you hearing that are you seeing that oh. are you believing that because where i'm going at is i thought the microbiome was destroyed because we're just eating out of 
packages and foods. I mean, when I took a nutrition class, they said, um, when it got to label reading, they said, look, the only thing you need to know about reading a label is that if it has a label, don't eat it. I mean, eat just real food. There's no label on a banana, <laughs> an orange, an apple. And when people say, well, the Happy Meal's convenient, well, an apple and an orange and a banana, is, that's pretty well packaged and convenient too. But I thought you had to stop eating out of a box and a can and frozen and start eating just normal animals and plants fish chicken birds dinosaurs and and plants but but you're saying that you need to get your vitamin d up before you stop eating out of cans or or uh, is, is it mostly diet or Okay. So yes, absolutely. The fecal transplants work and they're, it's not a super difficult procedure to undergo uh, for the gut microbiome. Because let's remember, where did we get antibiotics from? From bread mold, right? So our normal microbiome does a great job of defending us against invaders, and the two ways that we lose our microbiome, first is the vitamin D deficiency because vitamin D is a growth factor. And second is glyphosate. So if you eat foods that have been sprayed with glyphosate, it will actually inhibit vitamin D absorption and, uh, and have a harmful effect on the microbiome. So those are the two ways that we we lose the microbiome. And even with, you know, periodontal disease, uh, because we have a gut microbiome, we have a mouth microbiome, sinus, skin, even now a brain microbiome. Uh, so when we can get the D levels up and we get the microbiome back, it's really remarkable what an improvement you'll see in uh, the patient's plaque buildup, tartar buildup, all of that, because our bacteria that have evolved to grow with us and protect us and provide all of these wonderful proteins for us, they're the ones that are best at keeping invaders away. I noticed that, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I'm sure you're well aware of that. And it seems like during this pandemic, um, um, some some critics have called on the government and said that, you know, this would have been a classic time that why you told people to um, stay home and, and isolate, it would have been a perfect time to tell them uh, to get healthy. And, and I understand the, the big um, debates. I, I totally understand you know, this country's um, divided in half, and it, it always has been. And, and, <laughs> and it's not the worst of times. Be, I mean, when people say this is the most divided country, I'd like to remind them of the Civil War 100 years ago, where 160 years ago, where one in 30 Americans died. During, you know, that was a lot bigger. But, um, and, and, but you know, some reality things, like you mentioned smoking earlier. Um, smoking kills, um, I, I, I've read that it kills 400,000 Americans a year. Well, COVID-19 uh, uh, has only killed 250. I mean, if, if we're really going to shut down the country uh, for health, why didn't you pull cigarettes during the pandemic? Say, hey, you know, it's an aerial. It's not like the, the last pandemic I lived through. The first one was HIV. And AIDS went on to kill 36 million people. I mean, it was horrible. And we made a lot of adjustments. And when this pandemic came out, if you were really willing to shut the country down for 250,000, some people say, well, you should have pulled tobacco and say, you know, this um, AIDS was a bloodborne virus. This is an airborne virus. It's an aerosol. Not a good time to be smoking. A lot of people are, are saying um, that it would have been a great opportune time to say, hey, I'm sorry, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we really, if we're going to go this far, this would be a good time to um, stop smoking and go plant a garden. When you're at home, you know, and you're isolated, why don't you go outside and plant a garden? Because when I hear all these people talking about, um, well, you know, some parts of town, they don't have any fresh vegetables or this, that. Dude, I grew up in Kansas. I mean, a small garden in Kansas would have been about at least the size of two pickup trucks. And I mean, when I came home from school every day, I'd like almost run the last block because I want to see what my tomatoes did or my carrots did or my pumpkins mm -hmm. for Halloween. And um, it seems like um, it seems like that. Do you think that was a missed opportunity where maybe leadership should have said, 
th- this would be a really good time to get healthy. Absolutely. Because we have this uh, virus that is having such a wide spectrum in the way that it presents in people. So in some people, it just blows right through them. And then in others, it uh, can cause death. And so, so much of how we express this virus has to do with how healthy we are. And I, I do think this would have been a really great opportunity to focus on our health, the way we eat, our diet, our exercise, um, and you know maybe pass some legislation that you can't use Roundup and glyphosate on the beautiful farms in Kansas. Well, Just throwing that out there. Well, you know, I thought it was very, very bizarre that the Roundup that 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 company sold and they sold to a German company. And I thought, yes. oh my God, someone please tell the German dentist this is a really bad idea. This is gonna be the the this is gonna be a the lawyers are licking their chops waiting for some big rich company to buy Monsanto. And I thought I I, I thought Monsanto, I mean, it it'd be like I mean, I, I just thought that was the dumbest idea in the world. Um, I don't know. Do you think by being in Germany, they're more shielded from U.S. law or whatever? Uh, but I, I want—I don't want to get on the Monsanto. I want to get on um, during this pandemic, though. What you're talking about, vitamin D, is all over. You, you read it all the time. But they're also talking about zinc. It's always vitamin D and zinc. It's never vitamin D. It's never vitamin D and B. It's always vitamin D and zinc. Yes. So for years, um, I I recommended to my patients and the medical profession also, the, uh, the, I would say, integrative physicians, that when you are catching a virus, right, to load up on zinc, load up on vitamin C, um, on echinacea, and vitamin D. And this really is just a magic formula for boosting up the defenses. Now, I don't know that it is a good thing to take zinc in high doses every day. I do think that at the very, very first sign of the cold, when you feel that little itchiness in your throat or your nose getting stuffed up is when you should start taking the higher concentrations, but I, I don't know that I would do it um, every day in a high concentration. No. Huh. And, so um, go, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so I just, uh, you were talking about smoking and something that is very interesting about smoking is that the microbiome um, makes vitamin B5 and B5 makes the acetylcholine in our brains. Acetylcholine helps us sleep. It runs our rest and digest system so we can feel calm, relaxed. When we're awake, it helps us to focus. And acetylcholine binds nicotinic receptors in the brain. And we don't have any drugs to replace acetylcholine when there's a deficiency, right? The only thing that can replace it is nicotine. So when people smoke and they have such a strong addiction, part of that is because that they're not getting enough sleep and the microbiome is not making the acetylcholine they need. So the smoke, smoking habit is what is helping them to feel calm, to sleep better, um, and that's why it is so addictive. It's replacing a very critical neurotransmitter in the brain. I knew, I noticed early on in the pandemic, nobody wanted to talk about this, a couple of studies that were saying that, at first they were saying that smokers were catching it less. And, and I mean, I, I, I haven't read any of those studies since March, but I, I posted three or four on Dentaltown. But at first they were saying smokers were having less and they thought that the act of smoking somehow inhibited um, the SARS. Um, did that theory uphold through the pandemic? And is that 
uh, no longer um, theory. I, being you know, I and I also know as being bald that they that boys were higher at death than girls, and they thought that the um, the virus entered the um, the androgen receptor and not the estrogen receptor, and um, you know that it was better to be a girl than a boy. It was better to be a boy with hair than a bald boy. Uh, but um, um, so so I want to ask you something because you sound um, so naturopath. You sound so uh, holistic, and I always, um, I, I know my audience well because I've lectured a thousand times in 50 countries. I know my dentist, and if they're over 50 years old, they're all conservative, they're mostly males, and you say holistic or natural or anything like that, and they, 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 they freak out. And I like to remind them that on this very show, um, when dentists come on and they say that they're natural paths or holistic, whatever, they get people driving an hour across town to go there. And, and, and it's funny because the dentist is all against that until he gets sick and they're going to put him on high blood pressure and him on a statin. And, him, and then all of a sudden they're like, I'm not taking big pharma pills. I'm going to change my diet. And I'm like, oh, so... So when your doctor told you you had high cholesterol and high blood pressure, now now you're one of them holistic natural path guys. It's kind of funny how until you walk a mile in their moccasins, you don't get it. But when people are say they're holistic or natural path, what they're saying is they don't believe in big pharma. They don't believe. I mean, you just go to doctor. Oh, can't sleep. Here's a sleeping pill. Oh, you got a headache? Oh, here's another pill. Oh, you got arthritis? Here's another pill. You, you tell them five symptoms, and they give you five prescriptions, and you know polyphagia, by the time you're on five prescriptions, you're falling apart, and everybody knows this in the research world, and I think it's a it's a trigger word, um, naturopath, holistic, anything like that, and what, what they're saying is, dude, they don't buy into the system. I, I, don't, I don't buy into the government. Um, I, 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 I've been a registered libertarian my whole life. I mean, if you like one party over the other, well, one robbed the bank, one drove the getaway car, and from 1860 to 2020, those that they're not perp, they're not blue and red. It's a shade of pink. It's a pink weirdo. I, I call them pink turds, and they, they've been driving this country off a cliff for 150 years, and that's what the patients think of big pharma. They don't want a prescription. They would like to try to heal this naturally by diet, exercise, something. They don't want to go to some guy who speaks Latin and writes them a Latin prescription that they have to take to Walgreens and 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 take a pill. And and for all you dentists out there that aren't naturopaths, that just means you haven't had your first disease yet. Because if you're a dentist, as soon as you get a disease, you're going to turn into a hippie and start being a naturopath. You know, they, that's, what, that's what happens to every one of them. So um, do you call yourself naturopath, holistic, natural mother nature or just go with lady die <laughs> you know i don't i uh i don't i don't really market those terms i think i am someone who does pay attention to nature and pay attention to the habits and lifestyles and foods that really kept us healthy for thousands and thousands of years um, but also I am Carl Misch trained and, you know, Lanap trained and uh, Pat Allen trained. So uh, I just like to provide the highest quality dentistry that I can and see my patients get healthier in the process. Nice. Um I've had on Carl Misch. He passed away. I've had on mm -hmm. Pete Dawson. I've had on John Coyce. Um, tell tell us about Pat Allen and why he's in the same category as Misch and these other legends. Why, why, how did he make such a big influence on you? Uh, so he taught me the um, root coverage technique of using alloderm rather than the palate to um, enhance soft tissue. And he developed this wonderful procedure, the, the, the tunnel procedure that really made alloderm go from a material that was, that worked some of the time to a material for root coverage that was extremely predictable. 
And this just revolutionized my, my soft tissue practice because I had so many more patients saying yes to root coverage. The results are so beautiful. Even I can't tell where I worked. I have to look in the chart. Um, and they, uh, they have such a fast recovery. You know, it, it's, it, it's, you don't have to listen like for years and years saying like how painful the palate was and they still can't feel the palate and they're numb and it was so traumatic and worse than childbirth. So he's really taken the fear out of root coverage procedures. And I, I really appreciate that. And if you're wondering who she's talking about, uh, Pat Allen is very closely related to Edward Patrick Allen. And uh, so, but he, you, you call him Pat. He just goes by Pat. Uh, yeah, he, he's, uh, he's a very hard guy on SEO uh, because uh, that's, his, that's his middle name. Uh, yes. that, that is so cool. Well, I noticed, um, you know, he's from Texas, and so is um, your um, Dr. Stasha Gomanak. Uh, she's from Tyler, Texas. Um, do you have a thing for Texans, or what are you, a Dallas <laughs> Cowboy? Uh, deep down inside, are you just a, a big Dallas Cowboy fan? Or, or uh... It's funny you ask that, because uh, my brother turned me on to American football when we lived in Iran. And one of the teams that we watched all the time were the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> so that was the first team that I grew up watching. And my brother was a huge fan of, you know, Staubach and Tom Landry. And um, so, you know, so the Dallas Cowboys definitely have a special place in my heart. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of cool guys either are from Dallas or uh, Texas or moving to Texas. <laughs> um, and and uh, to remind the Americans, um, when you go around the entire world, football is only means soccer. <laughs> and they call it football everywhere, right? Like in Iran, did yes. they call it football or soccer? We called it football. Yeah. And did yeah. you spell it F-U? I mean, I know um, a different language, Persian, all that, but but was it usually F-U-T-B? Oh, yes. oh, B, B yes. A L L F U T yes. ball. Yes. Yeah, and the mm -hmm. the American football um, and the Australian football. The Australian football. You ever watch Australian football? No. Oh, it's completely. <laughs> oh, I mean, you take the difference between soccer and American football, um, or football F U T ball, uh, and American football, and Australian football is just another league of. Um, difference i mean it's just um it, it's funny how uh, uh that deal but what i loved it the most is um when you're in a really really poor countries like say Kathmandu or san paulo brazil you know in, in in arizona everybody has their lawrence fitzgerald shirt with their number 11 but you go to Kathmandu, and mama would just take a piece of charcoal and she'd write the number on your skin and you don't know what fans are until they're wearing a number that's actually painted <laughs> on their bare skin by their mom. Oh my gosh. I thought American fans were just amazing until I watched a World Cup game in Paris. And then I realized, <laughs> God, the Americans, they're they're sleeping through the whole game. Americans don't even know what a fan is. And in 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 uh Paris during a, a bad call, they're they're out in the streets. I mean it's just it's so fun. Yes. In fact I was in Paris during the World Cup games about uh, I want to say four years ago, and it is just so much fun. And they have a soccer ball in the Eiffel Tower, and uh, <laughs> everybody's into it. It's so much fun to be in Europe during the World Cups. I, I, I really love France. Like, like right now, they're taking to the streets because the police have passed laws that you can't film them with your iPhone. I mean, you know, the one thing we've learned from 5,000 years of recorded history is there's just two things. I, I don't want to talk about right or wrong. I don't even believe that. I, I believe in transparency and checks and balance. And if you don't and if you don't let anybody know what you're doing and nobody can stop you, it's always going to be really, really bad. You need transparency and you need checks and balance. And, you know, in these dentists, um, it's so funny how some of the dentists that you just think are just the strongest leaders in their community then they get one yelp review that's negative 
and they have like a complete mental, you know, you have to, you have to talk them off the ledge and, um, and they get so mad when an insurance company challenges, they're like, do you know who you're talking to? I am God dentist the third. My mama was God dentist the second. And, and it's like, dude, if there's no checks and balances and you're not going to show me what you're doing, I already know where this is going. And the, when, and when the police officers in French, when the, when the, French government passed a law that said you can't videotape a Frenchman. They're like, really? Well, let's see how that's going to work out. And they went right to the police station and started tearing it up. And it's like, dude, you got it. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to argue with that. But um, my gosh. Um, so let's go to, since you're just queen controversial, let's, hell, let's dive into Lanap. I don't think you could uh, say anything more controversial. Um, and, and I got to do a shout out on Lanap because um, I, one thing I got to say on Lanap is um, in my own backyard, I knew um, one of the Peridonis was uh, smarter than, you know, he, he, he was too damn smart to even uh, be in, in the game. It was Alan Honigman. And he was the first guy in Arizona. He was on podcast 399. I only got him. I shouldn't even have got him on. I knew it was real controversial, so I got him on there. And I told him, I said, I feel bad doing this because everybody's going to listen to this and just shoot you down. You might as well just climb a flagpole naked and hand everybody a bow and arrow. But he said, no, 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 I'll, I'll come on. And he talked to Lanap, and everybody disagreed with him. And here locally, people are just rolling their eyes like, I can't believe Alan fell for that. And then after five years later, I'm like, oh, well, you were telling me Alan was crazy for getting Lanap, and now you got a Lanap. Now I don't even know a Peridonis in Phoenix. Metro. I, I don't know one. In fact, I podcast a, a Peridonis in Washington, D.C. two days ago. He has three. So why did this start out so controversial, and how did it convince a Harvard brain like you uh, to get on this? What what was the uh, what what was the deal that pushed you over? Alan Honigman <laughs> convinced me to get it. Oh my God! You know Alan? <laughs> I do. In fact, I used to when he was a periodontal resident. I used to. Uh, on you know, on Fridays, go in and assist him with his osseous surgeries in UCLA. So that's how I knew Alan. And uh, I ran into him, you know, like maybe, I want to say eight or nine years ago. And he said, you've got to get this laser. You've got to do Lanap. And I thought he was crazy. I was never going to buy a laser. And, you know, there was no science behind it. And of course, um, it was like hocus pocus. But I studied it. And um, and Mark Nevins came out with beautiful human histology to show that you can, in fact, get regeneration of the PDL, cementum, and bone in very advanced rotation-involved molars. Uh, so then I was a little bit more open-minded. And the LANAP, it's the only laser that you can use it for six months and be able to return it if you don't like it. So I thought, okay, uh, I'll try it. I'll try it and see how I like it. And uh I don't think I could ever go back to doing osseous surgery. Uh, I'm a total Lenap girl now. I've seen the clinical results never fail to amaze me, the patient response. And when patients realize that there is a laser technique that's FDA approved to reverse gum disease, they uh, the look of relief on their faces when they have a second chance at keeping a tooth is really moving. Okay, and how far out on a limb would you say you and Alan and Lanap are compared to the 5,000 periodontists in the United States? And by the way, um, you know, orthodontics, I always want to remind you, you know, there's truth in numbers. And I've always said when you're looking at a business, aim for the only goal of a species is to survive long enough with enough resources to reproduce, have offspring and orthodontics. There's 
you know, I own OrthoTown, and we, we mail to 11,800 orthodontists. If you cut that number in half, each half is bigger than number two and three, oral surgery and periodontist. So there's just a, I mean, it's more, it's 10 times more likely mom's going to put Billy in braces instead of getting veneers for herself. And when you go to fix up grandpa, they're like, uh, well, you know, no one ever cries at grandpa's funeral. They, they only cry at grandma's funeral. Like, have you ever noticed when you go to a funeral, if it's grandpa, there's like, good, good man, good life, great guy. But when grandma dies, they're all crying and bawling, you know. But um, no no, no, 70-year-old grandpa is going to do a $50,000 remake if his kid needs to go to school, if his granddaughter needs braids. I mean, I'd give, I'd give both of my kidneys and my liver to any one of my eight grandkids that they need. I, I wouldn't spend 50000 myself. But um, but what percent of the periodontists do you think are now following you and Alan and believe in Lanap, and how many are still um, not just neutral but against the whole concept? Oh, there are so many periodontists, and actually several of the AAP past presidents are Lanappers. Uh, so... The tide has, and in fact, I think when the company first started out, they were selling more lasers to general dentists, and now they are selling more lasers to periodontists. Um, so, um, it for sure it is becoming more and more mainstream. And what do you what do you think uh, turned that around? Was it just time, or what? What what was it? I, I do think that the uh, histologic studies that came out were so strong and the FDA approval that came out really helped to give uh, clinicians that boost of confidence, you know, that there was science and FDA backing um, behind the laser. And then, uh, and, I, and I don't know if economics have anything to do with that. Uh, switch from more GPs buying it to more perio uh, uh, dentists buying it. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I I do know a lot of people around the time that I decided to buy the laser felt comfortable buying it periodontist just because of the studies and the FDA approval. And um, what do you, I mean, you, you say you like um, follow Pat Allen um, and you say that, um, you know, you're following Alec Honeman, but they, they both have the same name, Alan. It's just, it's just, just an Alan thing or is there uh, an actual uh, reason, uh, why you say that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's probably just the, uh, law of probability. <laughs> It's just a law uh, the probability. Name of, uh, the name Alan would show up this many times in, uh, the dental field. <laughs> oh. And actually there is a, 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 I have another Pat Allen here in Los Angeles, who is a very dear friend of mine too. So yeah, who knows? Maybe it's the law of attraction. I don't know. <laughs> so um, my gosh, I mean, seriously, your queen controversy the other thing that you said when when i was studying and reading up on you i was like oh, i i mean my, she's she's giving me so many free shots um <laughs> the other one was the um myofunctional i mean when i have i've had i've done 1500 shows and i've had 50 orthodontists on here and i always ask them what do you think about myofunctional and they're like what and i'm like what do you think about my and they're like dude that's insane. I mean, so I, I point blank have asked like the last 10. I say, okay, do you, what percent of the myofunctional do you agree with? I mean, half, a third, 1%. And they look at me and they go, zero, nothing there. Go home, you know. I, I mean, I mean, you couldn't get more adamant. Or These are orthodontists. They're, they're dentists. They go three more years. They get another degree in ortho. And they, they don't have anything Good to say about myofunctional. I, I can't even think of a myofunctional orthodontist in the state of Arizona, and and you're a Harvard. Uh, I mean, you're 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 a brainiac, and you like myofunctional. We're, we're, why? Well, you might want to hold up I mean, your shield as you answer the question. Do you have a shield <laughs> or an, an armor? You should have. You have one of those. Uh, you have one of those uh, Roman shields. Uh, we're only uh, a slit in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, 
muscles are so important for form and function, right? And we are seeing uh, an epidemic of mouth breathing in patients instead of nose breathing the way that we are meant to. And we know that the jaws and the teeth grow around the airway and the airway grows around the tongue. And the tongue is a primarily an airway dilator. So if we look at it from the perspective that we have this big muscle that, um, you know, when I was in school, the tongue was just something you had to get out of the way so you could do your work. <laughs> but now we are seeing that the tongue with so many people having airway issues, with so many people having a, a lack of adequate oral volume and the tongue is pushing forward, trying to make space, trying to dilate the airway. And in fact, in the 1950s, Professor Ray, a periodontist at UCSF, who was the uh, president of the American Academy of Perio, published the paper that tongue thrusting causes periodontal disease. So uh, for me, it's just a matter of understanding the dynamics of muscles in uh, the way that they affect bone, the teeth, um, mouth breathing. And, and I do try to get my patients, if I see that they're mouth breathers, try to convert them to be no nose breathers. And myofunctional therapy helps a lot with that. Uh, so in my practice, I use it as a tool to help my patients go from being mouth breathers to nose breathers and also to get them to stop thrusting against the teeth and the bone with the tongue, which the tongue exerts four pounds of pressure each time that it pushes against the teeth. And we swallow 500 to 1,000 times a day. So that's a lot of lateral pressure. Uh, so the myofunctional therapy really helps to develop strength in the back part of the tongue so that it postures up against the palate during swallowing. So it forms the seal by uh, pushing up against the palate, which has that nice thick bone that is designed to be a fulcrum and not up against the teeth. Um, you know, every year 6,500 kids graduate from dental kindergarten school and they go out and um, they, they have to deal with something that's much harder than chemistry, geometry, and physics, and that is patients and their humans. And, and wording is everything, and you got to explain everything like they were, you know, I always say explain to them like they're five, because like I say, I just know dentistry and economics. I mean, I've never got grease on my hand from fixing an engine because I grew up with five sisters playing Barbie dolls till I was 12. If, if you're telling me why my car needs fixed, um, you need to explain it to me like I'm five. And mom looks at him and says, hey, th this braces thing, it's like six grand. Is, is this just like some pretty cosmetic thing or, or is this a health thing? I mean, and, and it's tough because we have a dentalist patients. Um, I mean, <laughs> oh my God, one of my favorite patients, my two favorite patients are one is when I get there at seven o'clock in the morning, she's out there in her electric cart, um, having her last cigarette before she comes in for the appointment. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're riding a cart with an oxygen tube, uh, smoking at the door of the dentist, I God, I just love that lady. And, um, and another one is a guy come in, um, they, they, they come in. I got a bunch of grandpas that come in and they'll, they'll come in for a cleaning. I'll say, can I check your partial? And he's like, ah, oh, I forgot it, man. I, I set it out right by my keys and then I left it on the counter. I'm like, man, you forgot your upper teeth when you're going to the dentist. How cool is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but um, do you think what percent of orthodontics? I mean, I get it. Um, you know, the number one, function in life is to survive and look as pretty as a peacock until you can attract a primate mate and reproduce and have offspring. How much of orthodontics and Invisalign and all this stuff is just to help me attract a primate for mating? And how much is it do you think is actually a health issue 
that you need to correct? Uh, so, uh, first, you just reminded me of two stories. With, <laughs> <laughs> well, Carl Misch was the very first teacher that I had who talked about the tongue and tongue thrusting and how a patient who tongue thrusts is not a candidate for single stage implant because that implant has a high risk of not osteointegrating. And he would teach us to really diagnose myofunctional disorders and, and the tongue thrust to reduce the risk for implants. And I also remember him saying that if you're going to make a partial or a denture, you might as well take an impression of the drawer <laughs> because that's where the appliance is going to sit most of the time. <laughs> So it doesn't surprise me that the patient wasn't wearing it on the way to the dentist. It was probably, you know, uh, being forgotten in the drawer. But uh, for orthodontics, I mean, our attraction to people is we're attracted to people who look healthy. And so people who have a good jaw structure, who have a good airway, airway is such an important key to being healthy. Uh, look healthier, have, have more attractive bone structure, and are more attractive. So I do think that that health piece um, is part of the, the draw, you know, why we're attracted to people with straight teeth and good bone structure, because, you know, the, the airway is so important for health. And, and we want to mate with people who are healthy. You and I both have a love uh, affair with uh, Carl Mesh. I mean, I love yes. that guy. And he was such a great teacher because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the only sport I played was because of the coach. You know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I followed one coach. I, um, you know. Um, I, um, my, my wrestling coach, I just thought he was great. He, he just walked up to me on the first day of school and he goes, how much you weigh? And I said, 93. And he goes, I need a varsity 98 report to wrestling, uh, October one or November, whatever it was. And I said, um, you know, I got, got five sisters playing Barbie dolls. And I said, uh, well, I, I, I don't want to wrestle. I, I, I don't want to do that. And he goes, well, I, I don't care if you want to do it. You're going to do it. Damn it. I need you on the team. But anyway, he just, he stayed after me. And Carl Misch, uh, is, this is so embarrassing. You know, the only reason I got my fellowship in the mission institute is I was, I noticed when I got out of school in 87 that whenever I went to a CE course, it was always the same hundred people in a town that had 4,000 dentists. And I noticed they were all members of the AGD. They all got their FAGD. They all got their MAGD. And I didn't want my FAGD and my MAG. I ended up getting them. But I just wanted to hang out with people who were going for it and like dentistry instead of a bunch of drinking buddies who just hate dentistry and hate everything about it, you know. And to get my FAGD and my MA, to get my, um, to get it, I had to take um, and, and at that time, Arizona didn't have any dental school. So, you know, if you have a dental school up the street from you, it's so much easier to get all this CE. Um, but I had this huge requirement in implants and I called the AGD president and said, I, I don't, I don't want to place implants. I, I, I want to take all that in fillings and crowns and I, and I want to get an exemption from that. And he goes, well, I'm not giving you an exemption and you need to go learn this. And I said, you're not listening. I don't want to learn this. I don't need to learn this. This is a waste of my time. And he said, well, you're going to do it. And I said, well, look at all these requirements. He goes, dude, you could, you could do the whole requirement at Carl Misch's course, fly to Phil, uh, fly to Pittsburgh, who I was in love with the Steelers and, and, uh, mm. uh, and Swan and, and all those guys. And it was seven, three day week. And he goes, Howard, seven, three day weekends. Uh, and and you'll be done with it. So I went down there with this nasty old attitude and I was all mad. My <laughs> God, I listened to Carl lecture for about 15 minutes and it was just love at first sight. <laughs> and what I loved about him is no question was too dumb. No question was off limits. And no matter how stressful it was, he could always make you laugh. And, um, and, and the reason I got over my fear of implants, cause I was so nervous about doing this. My first implant it was like, um, it was like a sinus lift and a, and an implant on my mother-in-law. She, you know, she, <laughs> she, she volunteered and, um, oh my God. And, um, um, Carl, you know, I was all scared of that, but I would be watching Carl 
drop like six on the upper and six on the lower in like 30 minutes. And the whole time he's doing it, he's looking at me, talking to me. And it's like one of those drivers like, look, I'm not going to talk to you in the car if you take your eyes off the road. You know, stare at the road. Don't look at me when I talk. Carl would look at you during half the surgery while he's plays. And it's kind of like, this is a bad analogy, but it's, it feels like I went to like war. You know, it's like I went to war and then come back, and my assignment was I had to get a BB gun and shoot a frog. And and you just can't watch Carl Misch have three patients already put to sleep by anesthesiologists and just bumbly go from one to the other and place a half dozen dozen in each one and look like all he was doing is making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I mean, what a legend. And by the way, his, um, his interview that I did with him, I got him uh, one of the last interviews he did. And uh, my God, it's had 17,407 views. And what I think is the most amazing is how most people say, um, I guarantee you 17,000 dentists didn't watch that. Probably about 4,000 dentists watched it four times because, um, you know, we do an hour. And I think he went for, um, how long did he go for? Um, How long was it? He went for two hours and 41 minutes. And my God, that guy... There wasn't anybody he was afraid to throw under a bus. I mean, that guy, talk about dentistry uncensored. That guy was the original uncensored. And he sat there for two and a half hours saying, oh, that's so full of crap or that there's no research for that. I just love that guy. And I'm, uh, I'm one of those who watched that interview four times. <laughs> are you I'm like, so Yes, I'm so grateful that you did that interview. And there's really... a not a day that goes by in the practice that something he taught me doesn't go through my head. So impactful. Man, he was, uh, so, so you're, you remind me of Carl in the fact that you're, if, if, if you believe it's an orange, you're, you're, you're going to say it's an orange. And if everybody else says it's an apple, you don't really care. Where does that come from in you and Carl? Why, you know, so many dentists, like, like, like so many dentists, like I, I have dentists say to me, like, well, I, I'm not going to do Invisalign because um, at our study club, this one dentist are doing Invisalign and the orthodontist won't sit by him. I'm like, the orthodontist won't sit by him. Does the orthodontist pay your rent, mortgage, equipment? Is he going to pay your kids college? I mean, who gives a crap where the orthodontist said? Some people just don't care what everyone else thinks. Uh, Carl didn't. I don't. You obviously don't. Uh, anybody who talks about myofunctional research in a nap and vitamin D is a um, you know is out there. Where does that come from with you? Well, I think that um, you know, in Carl, he was such a patient advocate, and 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 that might be, and I see that in you as well, and so. You know, it might be a part of the personality where you want to take care of the patient, and that is the most important priority, rather than being attached to some, you know, silos or whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, the being a patient advocate is the quality that I see in you and that I saw in Carl. Um, so maybe that has something to do with it. And that's so true because I, you know, it, it's simple math. You know, you have the n- numerators on top, denominators on the bottom, and dentists are always, you know, the orthodontists were fighting with the general dentist with Invisalign until Smiles Direct came out, and they're like, God, Smiles Direct doesn't care about the orthodontist or the general dentist. They're just going to go direct, and it's always, you know, the dental insurance companies and the ADA. Like right now, it's time to pay your fifteen hundred dollar dues, and I don't want to, you know. I don't care what you think or believe on the top line because it's divided by the patient. And you keep one eye on the patient and one eye on cost and you use your God-given brain and talent to drive down the cost so that Americans have the freedom to afford the dignity to keep their teeth. And I don't want to listen to a bunch of rich dentists and specialists and insurance executives all argue and fight. I want to, I want to know about them 40% of Americans that can't afford to go to the damn dentist. 
And, you know, and, and that's another public health thing. You know, um, you're a periodontist and, and the, you know, the oral surgeons, the periodontist, the endodontist, uh, they're all sacred. And, and you pick up any magazine, there's always 10 articles on each one of them. And there's never anything on public health. And, you know, they just, they, they don't even want to care about public health. And it's like, uh, um, and when someone shows up in your office and they're in pain, if you can't pull the damn tooth or do a root canal, you should give your doctor your license to some foreign trained dentist who will come here and do it. I can, na- I can name you 50. If, if you go to Yuma, Arizona and cross, it's called Molar City. And I go there, I've been there several times. I mean, every dentist there could work on my teeth any day of the week. And if you can't be a public health dentist and get them out of pain with an extraction or a root canal, then I think you should drive to Molar City and give your damn dental license to someone who will. Um, and I, and I, I'm a big, heavy guy into public health. And uh, I don't care that the rich lady in Beverly Hills in Scottsdale lost her implant. Oh, wow, get me a violin and I'll play you, you know, a violin song. That, 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 didn't care, that didn't bother me. It's someone who's crying because their baby hasn't slept for three days, has a swelling, can't afford to go to the emergency room, doesn't have insurance, and, you, and, and, you know, that, that's where we're at. We got a child. She's in pain. She can't sleep. The mother doesn't have money. And you guys want to talk about politics and insurance and, and elections and Obamacare and all the crap. That, 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 that didn't even cross my mind. I got a three-year-old with an abscess that can't sleep, and I wish everybody would shut up until that's fixed. And as soon as that's fixed, then we can now. Uh, then you can go on to like, what were you talking about? Um, I can't believe we gone over an hour, and I'm sure you're sitting here. When is this guy going to shut up and let me go home? Um, but I want to ask you, um, can I keep you for some overtime questions? Of course. Um, I'm having so much fun. You're having so much fun. Um, when I look at all the specialties. Um, when I look at periodontics, when I got out of school, it was um, Dr. Charles Cobb, who, by the way, was big into lasers way before they were a thing. Charlie Cobb at UMKC, um, he was um, he was all over looking at him, studying, researching, critiquing him, whatever. Um, but it seemed like it was all like we want to save the natural teeth, and and we'll do a hemisection if they can't clean the furca. Let's cut that molar into two bicuspids, and let's do all this and the home cleaning and all these little tips and all that. And I graduated in 87, and it, it didn't even last 10 years, and people just said, you know what, this is all stupid. Let's just pull this tooth and treat it with titanium. And then the coral meshes became gods, and everybody was throwing the teeth away and sticking in, in titanium. And sure enough, that pendulum has come back. And I'm starting to see some of the some of the old periodontists in this town that used to be the first guy to recommend throwing the tooth away is now saying, well, you know, we should do three-month cleanings, and, and I can open up that furca, and I can, and I'm like, dude, you sound like some 1980s doctor. <laughs> um, is it, is it, is keeping your natural teeth, is it kind of like a, an oldies but goodie that's uh, some song that's coming back out on the airway? Well, you know, I just shared a, an article by Dr. Gordon Christensen that was in Dental Town. And I shared that on my LinkedIn uh, posts because he really expressed so beautifully what we are seeing, um, the trends in implant dentistry. And yes, when you follow uh, good protocols, they can work great. And I do think that dental implants work really, really well if a tooth is fractured or decayed beyond repair and they still have an intact periodontium. But once you add bone loss, periodontal disease and chronic infection into that site, now you're trying to uh, raise the bone levels, implants become much more challenging, not as predictable aesthetically. And we are seeing a lot of problems with dental implants. And so the question is, if you ask the patient, you know, do you want to take this out now and do an implant? Um, and, and something else Carl Misch taught me was if you can do traditional dentistry and keep a tooth for five years, that's what you should do. And so that's the option that I give my patients. And I'm always amazed how badly patients want to keep their own teeth. 
even if they've had a lifetime of neglect, when it comes to pulling it, you know, they they want to give it another try and they are very grateful uh, for dentists who want to, you know, honor that and, and, and try with them, fight with them. Um, I think that, um, my gosh, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine getting an earache and the doctor recommending to cut off my ear. I couldn't imagine going to an eye doctor and he says, well, let's poke it out and see if we can put in something better and fake. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, the fact that you can't even attach a three unit bridge to a natural tooth to an implant should tell you there's. And by, by the way, that that's a recurring question for all the uh, dental um, kindergartens. Um, you know, I think about a quarter of our viewers are still in dental kindergarten school right now. Um, and that, that still that does, it still plays with their mind. Can you can you explain that better than who's ever explained it to them before? Why you can't do a three unit bridge from an implant to a molar? Well, implants are rigid, and teeth have a PDL and they're mobile. So when you are attaching something that is so rigid to another structure that is mobile, the biomechanics just don't work as well. Well said. Um, same thing to the dental kindergarten class. Um, um, I'm a big believer in specialties because, again, in, in 1900, healthcare wasn't 1% of the GDP. There were no specialties. By the end of the century, there was um, it was 14% of the GDP. The MDZ had 50 specialties. We had eight. Now it's 2020. The healthcare is about 17% of the GDP. The dental specialties up to 12. Um, the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Paul Starr, that I read in 84, The Rise of the American Healthcare System, just laid out the blueprint of why this thing holds happen and we're not going back to 1900 where one doctor fixes your eye ears nose throat and delivers your baby and amputates your foot it's all going into specialty um a lot of them are very concerned about going into orthodontics because hell smiles direct club and scanning and making trays and and amazon sending them to your house that that's a lot of red flags for a lot of kids that want to be an orthodontist what would you say about periodontist i mean um you you guys have a um seen a lot in 30 years what would you say to a kid who wants to be a periodontist would you say run or would you say hell yeah oh i would definitely say hell yeah because uh i think that as long as there are people with tooth body parts and you enter a profession that really historically has been rooted in saving and preserving teeth uh, you will have a very fulfilling profession. And also to the orthodontist, I would say that uh, ortho, I think, will explode because, I mean, there's no question that our jaws are shrinking. There's no question that our tongues don't have enough tongue space. And anybody who is, you know, open-minded to expansion you know, expanding little kids while they're still growing and learning how to expand adults and give them their airways. Uh, it's a, it can be extremely rewarding. And God knows that there are plenty of people walking around who need expansion. Um, you know, back when, uh, and by the way, to you kids looking at uh, implants, I, I got to tell you the story of how this, th this did not start pretty. When I was in dental school, the implant started out as a ramus frame. I mean, subperiosteal ramus frames. Um, anybody that did them was um, fondly called um, a butcher of Langerhan and um, crazy people. Um, some of the earliest pioneers who did some of the most amazing work I'd ever seen. The first case that failed, the board immediately took away their license. And a lot of them would just fall into de depression and alcoholism and live in a trailer and finish out their lives after after restoring a hundred dental cripples uh, to this. And now when you say it's routine, so I always want to remind you of that story because, um, you know, you're always the first 
first to want to shoot down anybody with a new idea. And ever like Lenap was the crazy idea. And when and I, I was actually shocked that Alan fell for it. And now it turns out that you and the Harvard lady are right. Um, and the the implants guys have gone from butchers uh, to mainstream. Uh, so, you know, um, um, j- just just think about that. You know, everybody's got the, you know, we're one species. We got the same damn brain. And, and you know, you got two million dentists around the world. They're treating the same human with the same disease. And they all see some, when they see it differently in architecture, you appreciate that. When you see it in in, um, in cooking and cuisine, when, when you see it in architecture, art, cuisine, um, you, you love it. But when it's a difference in religion, you're like, you're ready to throw a rock at it. My two older sisters are nuns. I mean, you you couldn't convert them to any other religion if you spent the rest of your life trying. And I'm just trying to tell you that um, relax on this new stuff. And a lot of people are trying to try a lot of new things. Um, but um, I, what, I, what I also want to ask you is... Um, this is embarrassing. I, I'm so old. You know what the first main periodontal disease that I learned about and was scared about and was all ready to treat? A nug. That was the thing in the 80s. I mean, it was like every you, you talk to any periodontist, you couldn't talk to him for 10 minutes without a nug coming out. Is that much of a thing anymore, or did that kind of go to the way of the pterodactyls? It went away with penicillin. Is that what it was? Mm-hmm. Huh, because I remember you couldn't go to one periodontal class in in the 80s without um, one of the slides being a nug and, and things like that. Um, so is there anything else that you were hoping that we would talk about that we didn't talk about or anything else you wanted to um, discuss? Um, no, I can't think of anything. Um I, I just want to say how much I appreciate your podcast, Howard, and you just bring such a special brand of magic to the dental community. Um, so, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, yes. Okay, so so that was a nice that was a nice ending. We're still live, but now I can ask you a few more, just a couple more really controversial questions that you can bow out of because I know. It's a small community, uh, but um, I'm going to go right to it. And like I say, if, 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 if you just want to say pass, what, what do they say on uh, on Jeopardy and uh, Alex? What, what do they say on Alex Did you just say pass or did you not hit the buzzard? Or? I think oh, you, you don't hit the buzzard. Okay, if you don't hit the buzzard, if you don't hit the buzzard, <laughs> Kyle, look at her. Make sure she hits, hits the buzzard or something. Goes the, the pinhole technique. Um, some people are saying, well, we've been doing that for 30 years. You can't license and you can't call it a special technique. It's the same technique. And other people just love it and adore it. And they put it on their website. I do the pinhole technique. What's your thoughts on the pinhole technique? Pass or take the question? Well, you know, I mean, my preferred technique is using alloderm with the tunnel technique um, that I learned from Pat Allen. And... I what I love about that technique is that there is a lot of control over the uh, gingival margin area where I like to see thickness of tissue. So I do like to see at least millimeter of thickness right along the marginal tissue. And because the approach is through the sulcus, you have a lot of control over that. And it's just such a beautiful uh, technique. Um, so that is my my preferred technique that has worked extremely well in my hands, and I, I just have thousands of satisfied patients. Um, well, we so. we put up four hundred one hour courses on Dental Town. They've been viewed a million times. Um, if you ever um, got a great course, I'd love to have a course for you. Another one is very controversial and. Um, there was a there was a dentist in Kentucky, and I don't want to say his name, and I don't want to say the dean's name, but um, he showed and convinced me that chewing tobacco was healthier than smoking. I mean, obviously, 
chewing tobacco is just on your tissue. Smoking, it's on your tissue, it's your tongue, it's going down your lungs, all these things like that. But he did this great big epidemiological thing showing that um, switching people from smoking to chewing tobacco was obviously you're going to have a lot less death and mortality. And I mean, the, 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 the say the right thing people all got together and they ran him clean out of a job. I mean, they, they took his means of, of providing for his family away from him because the only message is that all smoking is bad. And I look at the money those idiots have spent on all their anti-smoking stuff. They probably could have hired 10,000 PhDs and cured the disease while well, they just decided to, you know, say no and, and all this thing like that. And now I'm seeing the same thing with vaping. If, if, if someone says, well, you know, vaping's better than smoking, it's like, well, that's not the right answer. It's all bad. And it's like, is, is, can, are, are, are we just supposed to say that nicotine comes from Satan and it's all bad, whether you smoke it, chew it, or vape it? Or are we intelligent enough to say, well, they're all bad, but smoking is the worst and vaping might be healthier and are chewing. Where are you set? Are, are they just exactly all the same thing? Or do you see that some are bigger and some are smaller than the others? I mean, it's, it's interesting you bring this up because uh, being in Los Angeles uh, area, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of young people who are smoking marijuana. And to me, this is the most severe uh, situation of smoking that I've seen because I'm seeing young people with advanced periodontal disease who might be facing tooth extractions. And I don't know if it's because the marijuana is unfiltered. I don't know if it's the higher heat, but I think marijuana is even more aggressive. And uh, I know a few people who have actually went in for wisdom tooth extractions with experienced oral surgeons, and they smoked marijuana after and ended up in the hospital uh, with... So vaping is marijuana? I thought vaping was tobacco. Yes. So I'm talking about... uh, I'm not talking about vaping. I'm talking about smoking marijuana. Okay. Okay. Yes. yes, Because now that it's legal. If if someone says they're vaping, is that... It could be nicotine or marijuana? Uh, That's a synonym? Yes. So I actually have to coach my patients that if you really need the marijuana medically to, to take the edibles... After a periodontal procedure. Well, you know, the, 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 the marijuana as a medicine, I mean, that that's the in most insane thing I've ever heard. I mean, <laughs> uh, the plant, I, I've heard if you smoke any plant, like, there's like 10,000 different chemicals. I mean, imagine if, if you need a penicillin, he wouldn't say, eat five loads of rotten bread and hopefully there'll be enough mold in there somewhere. <laughs> to, I mean, he would give you purified <laughs> penicillin. And if THC is going to fix a disease, I recommend you you take exactly THC at the right dose. But I don't believe you should smoke a tree trying to get some THC. So if if, if your best, I mean, that would be like going into Walgreens and say, yeah, I need twenty pills. Okay, we'll just we'll just throw a hundred different pills in a grinder, grind them all up, and give them to you. I mean, talk about non-specific treatment. Uh, but I meant vaping, um, smoking cigarettes. To uh, vaping cigarettes, to chewing nicotine, just those three things, no marijuana or any of that thing. Do you think they're all equally evil? I mean, all equally evil, or do you think that that one even could be safer than the other? I think that they are all equally harmful, but the danger with smoking is that you can smoke like two packs a day. You know, so the frequency of it can be uh, the frequency and the duration, I think, you know, can be a little bit worse. But I think that, you know, they're all bad. We know that tobacco chewing can cause uh, cancer, you know, um, because of the direct placement. And then we know, of course, of all the other harmful effects of smoking on periodontal disease, uh, and cancer. So I think that they're all bad. Okay. Now do you want me uh, last question? Now I'm going to get you in the biggest trouble ever. You're Are you ready to get ran out of town? 
They come out of school. They're young. They go work for a, and I don't want to say DSO because, damn it, DSOs get all the attention. It's group practice. And it starts with group practice that I love. I've always been in group practice. I think it's very emotionally unfulfilling to be the only dentist in the room. But then it goes to multi locations. And now, yeah, there's some that have a thousand locations, but it's just group practice, multi location. But let's just say group practice, one location. And the office manager tells the young kid, uh, well, if they got periodontal disease, look, look we're, we signed up these nine PPO plans and we get nine, we get so much money every time we place one of these chips and your patient, I'm looking right on the charting and she's got all these pockets. So go in there and stick, you know, 15 chips in there. And so we can build the insurance. And then that little young dentist is crying and saying, well, I, I don't believe in that. Um, what would you say? To that young little baby dentist, and and, and it's, it's not a chain; it's, it's it's the office manager of some big group practice dictating treatment, saying, "Hey, these chips work, and we make money from them. Go place chips in those holes." What what, what would you tell that little girl? Well, I mean, if it's going to be a, a numbers game. I- I would think that just bringing one LANAP laser in for the office and doing laser pocket disinfections and LANAP is uh, going to be a lot more profitable than placing those chips in, in, the, in the gingiva. Wow, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even see this, that, that answer even coming. I, I didn't see that. Well, you know what? Um, maybe, <clears throat> maybe... Um, my gosh, um, Alan did a course on LANAP in uh, 2015. That's 2020. Um, I think that you like me and Alan just because uh, we're bold. And I think you like <laughs> Alan and Pat Allen just because the Alan. But um, wow. So so you're you're saying you would rather have a LANAP disembreedment of the pocket than any uh, chip or cord or tetracycline impregnated chip or cord or whatever, you, you, you prefer the LANAP over that? 100%, because we have LANAP wow. and we also have laser pocket disinfection, uh, which the hygienists can perform in some states. And uh, I, mean, I mean, when I bought the laser and I introduced laser pocket disinfection for the hygiene department, I think I increased my production by almost $100,000 the first year because the patient acceptance was really high. The results were amazing. The redness gone, swelling gone, inflammation gone. And, uh, and, and then the patients, once they got that once, they would say, can we do this every year? So that's, uh, that, that's my personal experience. Wow. Well, you, you continue to amaze me and surprise me. I did not see that answer coming. And um, last but not least, um, I keep getting um, emails. My, my email is Howard at dentaltown.com. I do read the, the comments in the, uh, in the YouTube. So drop down there. Tell me what you want to hear. Um, that, that you didn't appreciate that joke. What, what, whatever the hell it, it is. But they, I do know from the comments, they want me to ask every dentist, would you take that vaccine right now? From Moderna, from Pfizer, yeah, you would you would you take the vaccine for COVID nineteen if they rolled it out to you tonight? No. And why? And what will it take? Um, do you need more time, or is this a uh, dead on arrival? You don't you don't buy into it. Uh, I definitely would need more time, and uh, I keep my vitamin D levels high. <laughs> between 60 and 80. So I feel that I, I have a very robust immune system. Um, so I would definitely need to see some safety data. Of course, I'm not anti-vaccine at all. Um, you know, uh, I was certainly vaccinated with the measles, et cetera. So I'm not anti-vaccine, but I do typically, that's just my approach to weight and just uh, make sure that the, the, the safety is there. Although this is a very new type of vaccine, um, you know, with using the mRNA. 
And so it's a different technique, which I'm thrilled about. And it seems to bypass some of the dangers of uh, the previous vaccine. So I'm definitely open to it, but I wouldn't get it like the first day. No. I thought the name Moderna was pretty cool. It comes from modern messenger RNA. I thought that was really cool. It was very hey, it cool. Was a, um, it was just an absolute honor to podcast you. Uh-oh. Sharona, um, every time I see your name, I want to start singing My Corona, uh, <laughs> My Sharona by the Knack. Uh, when's the last time you heard the song My Sharona by the Knack? I hear it all the time. <laughs> oh, my God. So, uh, it, it, I, I'm never, ever going to think of that song or sing that song because uh, you're definitely my Sharona. Uh, thank oh. you so much for being everyone's Sharona in dentistry. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of a long day uh, to do this. If any of my homies have a question, how should they contact you? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to be in touch with your homies. My office phone number is... 310-205-0900. Again, that's 310-205-0900. And I would um, just love to give back by maybe putting a, uh, a, a little course on vitamin D and how to supplement for dental implant surgery, if that's something that you know, you and your um, homies would appreciate in Dunnelltown. <laughs> we would. We'd love it. Um, I'd love to have a course for you on vitamin D. Um, three, uh, thanks for talking about rheumatism. And, um, and um, my God, uh, you ever want to come back on the show and talk some more, it'd just be an honor. Thank you so much for all that you do for dentistry. Thank you so much, Howard, for the invitation. This has just been so much fun. And you really uh, are a hero of mine. Oh my gosh, you got you got to get out more. You got to get out more. <laughs> All right, well hey, have a great day and thank you so much again for coming on the show. Thank you.